I would like to speak today about the astrology of octaves. And no, this is not related to music per se, but the interrelationship between personal planets and transpersonal planets, outer planets. Mercury to Uranus, Venus to Neptune, and Mars to Pluto. So this first chapter, I'm going to focus on uh, Mars-Pluto, the interrelationship between them, and how basically Pluto continues the work that Mars is doing, but elevating it to a transpersonal level. So this is happening, you know, May 17 today in the thick of a Mars-Pluto opposition. And we're going to speak about the broader concept aspects of this particular cycle. It's, it's fascinating and it's important. So stay with me and uh, I hope you enjoy this journey. Before we go into the material, I uh, want to remind everyone of the educational program that I'm leading, the River Star School of Evolutionary Astrology. A new cycle is beginning now uh, in 2023. In reality, you can join any time because a lot of it is self-study. And there are four tracks to choose from, depending on the level of commitment, if you want to just focus on certain parts of the study, or if you want to go for the full diploma program. So full diploma program means, aside from the amazing material, um, you have supervised practice, integration of the material, doing readings, and learning how to put all of this together all the chart components that are often difficult to synthesize. So I am preparing students for professional practice, whether or not you're gonna be a professional is really up to you, but it's high standard and it's an opportunity to have rigor depth in this practice. And your investment will pay off if you want to practice astrology today more, and ever, more than ever. You know, it is something um, many of us can do. Check my website, mauricefernandez.com. It's a very rich program. And if you resonate with this material, um, it's going to blow your mind. It's really an amazing program. So speaking about the octaves. Traditionally, before the discovery of the outer planets, which are not visible with the naked eye, um, our ancestors could only see as far as Saturn. And so the system of rulership was um, defined by this structure starting from the sun and moon uh, ruling respectively Leo and Cancer. <clears throat> and then on each side, Gemini, uh, Virgo, you have Mercury ruling, then Taurus, Libra with Venus, then Mars, Scorpio with Mars, excuse me, Aries, Scorpio with Mars. And then uh, Pisces, Jupiter, Pisces Sagittarius with Neptune and Aquarius Capricorn with Saturn. And so it all looks so neat. You know, uh, everyone has a rulership. It's, it's, it's basically cookie cutter organized. And then boom, came the outer planets. First one was Uranus in the 1700s, then Neptune in the 1800s, and then Pluto in 1930. So as technology uh, became more sophisticated and we could look more deeply into the universe, these 
planets uh, reveal themselves to us. And astrologers were quick to integrate them. So that challenged the cookie cutter traditional order of rulership. And that is being questioned today. Many astrologers do not accept that outer planets rule any sign. And maybe, you know, this video will will make you think about that. You know, I'm not going to make absolute assertion, but bear with me and you'll understand what I'm getting at. Still, as we look at um, the interrelationship between the personal planet, the Mercury, Venus, Mars, and the outer planet, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, we do identify a resonance, an interrelationship. And I am going to explore this today uh, with you, with the first chapter being Mars and Pluto. So if we define them uh, more specifically, um, Mars and Pluto rule Aries and Scorpio. So Mars is going to be the traditional ruler of Scorpio. Pluto is going to be the modern ruler of Scorpio. And like I said, I do see this working, you know, many years of experience and many readings and my, my own observation of life. Um, being a Scorpio, I can have personal references to uh, understanding Pluto, but don't take my word for it. Let's let's see what is this relationship about and how do we determine this rulership? So let's understand what Mars is about and let's understand what Pluto is about and take it from there. So if we look at it astronomically, it's interesting that the two, two planets, and yes, Pluto is a dwarf planet, so that's a new category. Um, I, I'm fine with that. I'm not one of those who struggle with Pluto being demoted. I don't think it's a demotion. I just think it's a classification. And the truth is, all the dwarf planets, Pluto, Haumea, Makimaki, Eris, and Sedna, and so forth, all really operate on the shadow level. So there's something that really astrologically brings them together. There's a thread. They, they kind of complement this kind of under the surface, edge of the solar system uh, qualities of exposing uh, the hard truths. That being said, uh, <clears throat> of all planets, uh, Pluto is reddish and Mars is red, red, red. And that's interesting, just say. Uh, doesn't prove anything, but these are the two red planets of the solar system. Mars is rocky, as are all the personal planets, and Pluto has a rocky core. I mean, they say 50% of Pluto is actually rock, and then there's a gas um, layer on top of it, which is interesting because it's going to be very different from uh, the composition of the other uh, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and, and Jupiter. And it's interesting that Mars, you know, is the last planet on the edge of the asteroid belt. So we have Mars, then we have a whole thousands of asteroids, and then way beyond that, Jupiter. And Pluto is 
in the Kuiper belt. So it's also this kind of <clears throat> belt of, you know, multiple bodies circulating at the edge of the universe. And, you know, notice my language, Mars is closest to the asteroid belt, Pluto is the closest in the Kuiper belt. So of all the dwarf planets residing in the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud and all these outer edges uh, region of the solar system, Pluto is actually the closest to Neptune. Not only that, you know, part of the reason why Pluto is still associated with rulership of the solar system is that maybe because it crosses Neptune's orbit and it actually spends, you know, um, a few years um, closer to the sun than Neptune is. For us, in our generation, this happened when Pluto was in Scorpio. And more, more precisely, from 1979 to 1999, Pluto was faster than Neptune, closer to the sun. So, um, nothing, you know, to prove about that, just interesting observations. Um, so what does that mean? You know, let's look at the natural structure of the zodiac. So Mars obviously rules Aries. All astrologers agree on that. Um, and what is Aries about? It's the first sign of the zodiac. So it marks a beginning. But the beginning of what, right? Always a question in a circle, is there really a beginning or an end? Um, there is relative to our existence on Earth, because if we look at this division, Aries is the point of the of the tropical zodiac where the sun path meets the equator of the earth path. That's where, that's where we have the equinox point. So Aries and Libra represent that time of balance between day and night, um, 21st of March, 22nd of September. So it is a beginning, the beginning of what? If we, be, if we understand that Aries represents those equinox point and we look at it from a, an astronomical point of view, Aries always points to the east, while Libra always points to the west. That's part of what Gemini Brett refers to as the directional zodiac. So Cancer is always north, Capricorn is always south, Aries east, and Libra west. And the eastern point on this planet is the point where everything rises because of the spin of the planet, of Earth. So there's a natural uh, development that happens in that equinox point. And if we look at the wheel, uh, this also marks the first house. So in my cosmology, astrocosmology, um, signs do relate to houses. So the first house do does relate to Aries. So what is it about? Once again, Aries is the birth birthing ourselves. This is when the baby, you know, exits the wounds and makes the first physical effort to separate from its mother. So there is a point of ripeness where individual life begins. 
as the fusion between the fetus and the mother is now complete, the 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 baby becomes more autonomous and increasingly more autonomous as it will, you know, make decisions. I mean, first start to crawl and to walk and to run and to speak and then make autonomous decisions. So that first house in Aries, uh, everywhere Mars in our chart represents that need to take charge of our destiny. Where is that energy coming from? Because as the baby separates and becomes autonomous, it begins to invest, expand tremendous amounts of energy. When the baby's in the womb, the baby is supported by the nutrition that the mother provides. You know, it's, it's a very passive state of receiving. So the moment the baby becomes um, stand on their own, they need to also generate a tremendous amount of energy to be able to get food and get their life together and lead their lives. So Mars not only represent that need to become, but also the energy supply that um, is available. And where is it coming from? Food air, oxygen, um, nutrition in general, and then maybe other things, which we can talk about. But what I would like to highlight here is um, Mars represents our battery, our supply of energy. This is why typical Aries people are the go, 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 do, 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 they are the active, they represent the active principle because they represent the fact that if you don't do, you may die. Um, there is that memory that I'm not in the womb anymore and I cannot rely on anybody. So Mars not only provides your energy supplies, but it's the most primal self-preservation instinct. You know, we all rely on our parents when we are old, uh, young. <laughs> um, and then when we're old, we rely on our kids. But as the baby exits the womb, the, you know, they are still dependent on their parent, but that dependence decreases with time. So there is a support system, which is the Cancer Capricorn Square, but progressively, um, the, the baby, the child, the adolescent, the young adult develops more and more capacity to take care of themselves and to not rely on, on their parents or anybody else. So... That is part of the Aries principle. Why? Why Why do we need to leave this womb? I mean, let's face it. It is more comfortable. It is safer. We don't have to work so hard. And most importantly, the risks of harm are less. I mean... Let's generalize this that, you know, in the case where the mother is healthy and, and she is taking good care of her self pregnancy and embryo. But there is still an impulse to separate, even in the best case scenario where, um, you know, we have a very healthy and uneventful pregnancy. Why is that? Nine months. So we examine the fact that the 12th house, you know, captures this universal womb. 
um, where we all come from. So there's the mother womb, which is lunar, and there's the universal womb, which is Neptune. You know, there's another correlation with Neptune. So in the 12th house, we are in that passive womb state where we receive everything from the universe. We receive light, oxygen, food, rain. Everything is provided for us. And this is why Piscean people, 12th house people, are usually trusting because they trust that, you know, things will be provided, that um, there is divine providence and that you don't need to fight. You don't need to be aggressive to get things done. So there is a natural state of receptivity, which then shifts when we get into the first house. And that first house represents that state of urgency, where on the one hand, we are born and it's exciting, but on the other hand, we are um, having to fight for ourselves. We can't just rely on our mothers to do the work. So I like to illustrate this Aries dynamic by the baby turtles hatching from their egg and then immediately have to start running, have to start going to reach the ocean. So that really captures this essence of Aries where on the one hand, you know, you are piercing the egg, you are breaking the shell and leaving the safe environment of the egg or the womb, but then you are vulnerable to predators immediately. And we as human have the privilege to be still very vulnerable and dependent on our parents, but some animals have to be born running. And the turtle does not have any contact with their mother. They will never meet their mother. So they're on their own from day one, pretty much. And that's an extreme of Aries energy. And so they have to cross from those sandy shores to the ocean to make that first uh, journey to safety. and. And it, obviously the ocean is not that safe. They could also be preyed upon by uh, marine predators. So th this captures basically the intensity of survival and that self-preservation instinct that Mary, Aries and Mars represent. Now, think of that energy in your own chart where Mars coding, you know, the message that you hear from Mars is never, ever, ever, ever give up. Life is more important than anything. So this is the place in you where whatever happens to you, you will fight to be able to survive another day. And it, you know, in the most basic ways is, is you being careful to look left and right when you cross the street, because you don't want to die. Or it's you making sure that you, you know, you're fed and you're as a baby gonna find the breast and the nipple uh, to get nutrition, all the things that you are going to do and develop to guarantee that you are surviving, that you're making it. Obviously, Mars is in a constant, you know, is pushing us for constant development and development of our strength, power. If we look at the turtles or any animal, 
the ones that remain passive, you know, if that turtle is hatching and basically waiting there on the sandy beach, it will be eaten. Look at a litter of kittens. You have the very um, proactive kitten who will grab the nipple and will start suckling, you know, very uh, passionately. When the other kitten is, is not fighting their way through and it's lagging behind and gradually not getting enough nutrients, you know, not having as much milk supply and then becoming weaker. And that can lead, if it's not rectified, to really a decrease of vitality and, uh, and a weakening immune system, then parasites, you know, take advantage of that. So Mars is, is a constant, um, it is a constant reminder and a constant state of awakening every morning when you wake up and you open your eyes, it's a Mars moment and then you get going. When you go back to sleep, you are in a Neptune zone. So that interplay between passive, active, um, surrendering to sleep, waking up to your day, are all that interplay between Mars and Neptune, opposite, complete opposite in their nature. And the question remains, why can't we sleep all day? Why can't we stay in the womb forever? And I mean, not just the mother's womb, but the cosmic womb. You know, what if we could rely on what is naturally provided without having to... Um, to separate from each other, to become autonomous, to fight for our food. And that is the very story of the Garden of Eden, because the Garden of Eden represents that passive state of a womb-like reality, where Adam and Eve are very naive, and they just are. They don't need to take action. They don't need to be. They simply receive what is provided by God, the universe, um, without any effort. And so at some point, the snake comes in and they, you know, th their quote unquote sin is that they make a decision that is an autonomous decision which is very aries like you know it's the decision to eat the forbidden fruit nobody said it was an apple um and so that forbidden fruit is basically the beginning of curiosity and the beginning of independent thinking not taking things for granted anymore adam and eve did not just passively obey anymore. And that moment marks the moment where they leave the womb, they leave paradise, and they have to now uh, fend for themselves and experience challenges and even hardships. So that is Aries, because the moment you leave the womb, the moment you're born, um, Nothing is taken for granted anymore. The supply of all that was provided is, is work. You have to work for it. You have to reach the nipple. You have to um, get enough nutrient. And then you have to go to school. You have to get a job. You have to pay the rent. All these things that require effort, strategy, thought, intelligence, and action. So that Mars of ours 
keeps us alive. It is that force, that willpower to keep going. Because I go back to the question, why do you wake up every day? It's Mars to begin with. Mars is the ignition of the engine. It's the ignition of your consciousness, of that engine. So basically Mars is you starting to think for yourself and you wanting to conduct the wheel to drive your own destiny and not just be led by the currents, not only be going with the flow, you know, some, there's a say that says only dead fish go with the flow. And there's something very true about that. Um, you can use, you can, you can surf the wave. You still have to navigate the wave and think about the salmon, you know, going upstream, climbing waterfalls to um, reproduce. And that's part of their cycle. So there, there are times when we can be in a passive state and, and minimize effort to use nature to ease on our labor. But even when we do that, we have to do it consciously. It requires thought, strategy, cooperation. We're not a driftwood. So your self-preservation instinct um, is a lot, a lot, a lot of work. A lot, a lot, a lot of energy. Life would be much easier if we stayed in the womb. And this is why in every possible uh, religious system, spiritual system, you know, there's this yearning to go back to God and this yearning to uh, transcend the material plane and go back to the spiritual plane, because the material plane is hard. <laughs> it's full of friction. And that's the beginning where Mars realizes I'm in this material plane. I am separate. And because I'm separate, I don't have access to all the resources the way I used to. But the truth is, there is no way back to the womb. So all our spiritual system that encourages us to go back are maybe misleading us. There's a reason why we're being born. There's a reason why we left paradise. And one of the reason is love. Interesting. Wait a minute, isn't Mars the warrior? Isn't Mars about self-preservation? Isn't Mars, you know, fighting and, and hunting and, and, and aggressive? All these things, absolutely, because Mars has to do with labor, with doing. And it means that it has to take charge of its own destiny. And that's a responsibility. So when I say part of the reason why we were born is love is because, yes, the tremendous amount of work that is required of us to stay alive and to, and to create and, and reproduce and, and make sure that not only we survive, but that the, our children will survive, which is the next fire sign, Leo, making sure there's continuity. Wait a minute. Leo squares Scorpio. Scorpio is death. And Leo trines Aries. Aries is the beginning of the spark of life, the ignition of the engine, the ignition of consciousness. So having children is part of that effort to make sure that we 
transcend death, that we are not going to die. Even if we die, our children carry the torch. Talk about fire. The fire, the torch is passed on to the next generation. So we start to see that interrelation between these different archetypes. And why love? That's because the fire principle is the principle of participation. It means you are here on this earth, in this life, in this existence, as an active participant, and you contribute to the creation. So, as aggressive as you need to be, as intense as you need to be, as guarded and, and you know, uh, all the fighting that is required is actually on a deepest level. It's an act of love because it has everything to do with working hard to be here, working hard to make sure that life goes on. It would have been, again, much easier to be, to remain in the Piscean state of bliss, a passive state of being that doesn't require the drama. You know, the moment you're born and you start pushing, that's when you start to cry, it gets loud. It's full of drama and ups and downs and risks and, and losses and victories and, you know, the the curve of emotions is spiking and dropping whereas from a neptunian point of view in the womb it's all even and still and and we have to ask ourselves you know why do we do all this it's because on a deep level we love life and we commit to make life happen and to keep life going and the participation in the process of life is fire this is why um on a deep level the fire principle a leo represents the heart it's the love it's a lion heart you know all this uh, has nothing to do with romantic love per se you know it's not about being horny it's not about romance per se it's about the romance of life it's about the meaning that we give the purposes the intention the love of life and if you love life then you love everything that lives you love everything. So on a deeper level, this struggle to be and the effort that we invest and the reason why we wake up every day is because we care. So the moment you care about something, you're passionate, you want to do it, you believe in it, and you have so much energy. Think about how we often associate energy with practical things such as oxygen, water, and uh, food. But and, and that's oxygen is air and water is water and food is earth. But where is the fire energy? Energy from the sun right it's the energy of love it's the energy of passion when you're passionate about something you forget to eat and you can go on and on for hours just on inspiration fuel so mars is not only the hunter who needs to you know kill in order to feed but it is also uh, that willpower that is in itself a battery, in itself uh, providing 
light and resource and that combustion um, that generates fuel and energy. So the motivation to exist keeps the fire going, keeps the fire lit. It's interesting, another interesting symbolism in the Jewish tradition where they celebrate Hanukkah, which is a celebration of light, you know, when uh, the Jews were hiding from the conquerors and they only had one candle and that candle ended up staying lit for uh, a whole week even though he didn't have enough fuel to burn and it should have gone out, you know, in a few hours, it stayed lit and it kept them going. And that was, you know, that celebrated during the Sagittarius season, which is a fire sign. But it, it's all about that. You know, the fire is about keeping the flame burning. As, as long as the flame is burning, there is light and that's why also the fire signs particularly leo also represent eyesight the ability to see because light gives you vision if you're in the dark you don't see anything so night vision you know is the moon but day vision is the sun that's why all leos wear glasses you know, quite often you Leos suffer from bad eyesight. Interestingly, it's it's part of their lesson, eyesight. Um going back to Aries and Mars, that motivation to keep going is is on the one hand the need to be the need to define yourself. I am Maurice. I am here for this and that purpose. These are the skills that I have. So everything that is particular to you, just like in astrology, we look at your day, hour, place of birth to see you. There's no chart that is exactly like yours. It's never going to repeat exactly the same way. So there's something about that uniqueness which differentiates you from every other thing, every other person. The only person that is going to be, you know, share the same chart is the one born on the same second and the same place as you. And that can happen, but then there are other factors to differentiate and discriminate. But from a Mars' point of view, your contribution is going to be yours. It's unique. And so all of us, through our Mars energy, our first house energy, we are here to discover who we are and what we're here to do. What is this life about? Why was I born? And then as you figure that out gradually, it's also how to get there. And then it's also how to not die before I complete my journey. So that whole thing about not giving up and, and plugging in and waking up another day and another step and, and developing new powers, new capacities um, to think, to do, to achieve, to overcome. So you develop through your Mars energy, through your first house energy, you develop your powers. Your willpower is boosting your immune system. And you, you know, you become a better astrologer. You become a better cook. You become a better hunter. You become a better this, a better that to basically manifest your destiny. You're in charge of your destiny. So as you fulfill your destiny, you are able um, to contribute to life, to the great greater scheme of things. So you contribute to that Neptunian ideal of collective well-being. So 
all that you know rage to be is going to uh um represent mars represents that need to face resistance you know it's like nothing is taken for granted food is not going to be provided for free you have to work for it and you have to prevail against contrarian winds against scarcity one of the laws of the universe is that yes nature provides everything but nothing is infinite everything can end so in winter you may not have enough food if you know there's a bad crop you won't be fat and if you don't hunt properly you won't be fat so even though nature provides all our tools and and light and oxygen it doesn't guarantee our survival and that's the hard work so wherever our mars is and if you want to get deep more deeply into it i'm going to mention uh the mars workshop offered on my website uh go to astrology studies by topic and so there's a whole workshop about each mars in each sign how it operates but here we're working on the principles of mars so great you know, we made it. Every day is a victory. Every day that we're still alive, we can celebrate. We did not die today. Our intelligence, our um, ability to, to navigate our life the right way kept us going. One more day. And so we continue our journey. And like I said, Mars can cooperate. You know, wherever your Mars is, is your strategy to stay alive, to keep your fire lit. Anywhere. If you have Mars in Libra, your strategy to survive is to cooperate, is to form alliances. If Mars is in Pisces, your strategy to survive is to camouflage, is to know how to retreat and when to retreat. Your strategy to survive with Mars in Aries is to charge, you know, make yourself big and scare people, scare your predator away. So each Mars has its own magic, its own uh weapon so to speak and its own goals so there's no good mars or bad mars <laughs> you know that's all like i don't know how to call it but it, it we have to respect every placement for the genius that it brings and the intention that it brings and so we progress like this you know through our Taurus and Gemini and Cancer, and we have kids and we make sure that they are going to be um, up to task. That's why we want to be good parents. And then in the sixth house, you know, we are really the expert, the master, uh, the Virgo and sixth house has to do with not only our strategy to survive, but our strategy to function and to produce and to harvest. So the sixth house is the harvest of our hard work. Not only, you know, when we see the symbol of uh, Virgo is, is the wheat. So it's the harvest of all the food, but it's also the harvest of our efforts. It's how we get things done. That's why there's a very deep interconnection between Virgo and Aries. And again, some will say, but they are quincunx and there's no connection. You know, it's a different element. It's a different mode. But Virgo and Aries are the 
sides that represent achievement. Or more accurately, it's the signs that represent getting things done. Very proactive. And that's why most athletes need Virgo Aries combination. Mars in Virgo, um, Aries Virgo planets. If you want to be a good athlete, usually, you know, a good dose of those will help you. Because it's physical, it's physical capacity. So you reach that place, you know, in the sixth house where things are done and your life function and you're healthy. And if you're not healthy, you know how to fix it. You know, it's, you know how to manage things. You're prepared. Virgo, you know what to do when there's a crisis. Then comes the seventh house, the Libra. And that's when you discover that autonomy has its limitation. You realize that you cannot grow all the crops. You cannot do everything. And you start to realize that uni unifying, uniting with others will give you an advantage. And nature is designed in such a way that we cannot have children alone. I mean, I know today there's a technology insemination and maybe coming up artificial wombs. But if we look at things from an archetypal point of view, there's a reason why there's male and female to complement each other. So the male realizes that they cannot get pregnant and the women, the female realize that they need to be inseminated. And that's the beginning of cooperation. In order for our species to continue, there is a need for cooperation. And so through Libra, we go through this humbling lesson of, okay, I need to make some compromises. I need to include someone else in my game and I need to create alliances so that I can go further. Because from Aries to Virgo, you've accomplished a lot. You have harvested your field. You know, you grew your crop and you tended to it and it's, it's all going great. But then, like we said, you reach the point where there are things you cannot grow and you need them. And there are things you cannot do and you need them. And that's the beginning of cooperation. That's the beginning of getting outside of yourself. And through the Libra, energy, the Libra phase of existence, you are basically, how to put it, um, you, you're looking around, you know, you're, you're glancing and seeing what's available and you're making connections, right? So, you meet several people and you see what are you lacking? What is it that people offer that you don't have? And you start to negotiate, you start to flirt, you start to connect. And there needs to be an exchange because how will you know that someone's not gonna eat you? How will you know that someone's not gonna take advantage of you? You need them. They need to need you. So there is a need for to create a situation where there's a mutual dependence in order to feel safe in the relationship. That's how you create peace. When you realize that I am more worth 
to you being alive than dead. You know, I, I can be one meal and that's over. But if you keep me alive, I can provide much more. And that's how you, you elevate your value, Venus, in the eyes of other people so that you can trade with them. Second house, seventh house, Venus, your resources and they, their resources. And then comes the eighth house. And then comes that very challenging phase. Because what happens in the eighth house is that you come to an end. That's why it represents death. So your Mars energy that kept you going, doing, surviving, is reaching the eighth house and it's a point of exhaustion. You know, in a simple way, you run out of fuel and you get to that situation where all your powers are diminished. And that is why you make that commitment to bond with another, because you realize not only that it would be fun to exchange resources with other, but it's a survival imperative. If you do not bond, if you do not connect, you won't survive, you will die. So that eighth house is, a, is some kind of realization that you're not invincible that you're not omnipotent, that you could lose things. You could lose your crop. You could lose your health. You could lose your support system. And that pushes you to start looking for a solution. If I cannot anymore rely on myself only, I need to start making these connections. It's a water sign Scorpio, and as a water sign, it it exposes your vulnerabilities. And through the eighth house, you see how vulnerable you are. And you see that you could, you know, th that you're immortal and not omnipotent. And You know, on a personal level, you, you feel that it's the end of your Aries cycle. So part of the reason why Mars co-rules Scorpio is that it's the beginning and the end of Mars, in a way. And, you know, why do we, why do we feel so depleted there? Basically... You know, the eighth house is the house um, where we need to realize that whatever has served us up to this point is not enough anymore to keep us going. So you, you start to realize that all your skills, all that you have, took you this far and it could be the end of your journey. So there's a risk of ending it there. But if we look at the wheel, there's a potential for more. You could potentially go much further. So Pluto is the first gateway to this transpersonal Reality, and that's why we're starting with the Pluto Mars pair, because even though Pluto, you know, uh, in the solar system, is, is the farthest away, in our astrology wheel, it's the first encounter with an outer planet, and that gate to transformation 
the first initiation into the rites of metamorphosis, of transpersonal awareness begins with Scorpio. And so when you reach the end of your rope, that can happen every time you have a Mars-Pluto aspect encounter. Maybe now some of you, you know, in this period of time reach a point where you cannot keep going the way you did. Whatever your strategy was, worked until now. It's not to be uh, devalued, but it's just not enough for the next step. And that's what Scorpios feel since they were born. It's not I'm not enough. This is why Scorpios usually have very challenging beginnings. You know, they can face rejection. They can experience loss. They can be the one, you know, who are not looking good and attractive. And so they, they have to kind of develop new set of skills to overcome their limitations to overcome the fact that they're not the pretty boy in the classroom. They're not the tallest one. They're not the richest one. You know, they're not born with privilege. They're born not feeling enough. And, and so that sense of tremendous limitation is a do or die situation where they realize that I could give up and, and resign myself to a miserable fate and be a reject, you know, be the one who's going to be bullied, be the one who's poor, be the one who is succumbing to health problems. Or I could transform and make up for this lack. And this is where Pluto kicks in. This is why Pluto rules Scorpio archetypically. Because Mars has done its work. You cannot keep going with the same Mars for another cycle or for the end of the cycle. Pluto comes in to say, you, whoever you are, you know, and whoever you are when you first started in your first house, if you don't change, if you don't develop a new awareness, if you don't challenge yourself and do the shadow work, you are not going further. And that's the Hades, you know, going to the underworld where you are going to face all your limitations and you're going to feel very small. All the victories that you thought were under your belt are not serving you anymore. So that kind of sobering wake up call that life is not only about surviving. It's not just, it's not only about doing. That's the first realization through the eighth house that life is about developing your consciousness. So you ignited your consciousness with Aries and Mars and boom, you open your eyes, went through your thing, did what you needed to do. And then there's a risk of your eyes, again, shutting down into the darkness of the underworld, where you realize, oh my God, I'm impotent. I can't overcome this Pluto monster. And yet Pluto comes with this hard medicine that says, if you develop your consciousness, if you start asking questions, if you are ready to change, you can get a second lease. You will get a boost. 
you will jump start your life. So if you have Venus Pluto, that's going to be a relationship. Your relationships are going to go through a phase where it's the end. You run your you ran your course, and unless you transform and do the shadow work, your relationship will die. So Pluto provides Mars with regenerative powers, with the ability to take the initial Mars, the starting point, and give it a turbo engine. But to get that turbo engine, something needs, you need to shape shift. You need to shift your values. You need to shift whatever is in your Scorpio corner or whatever is in your eighth house or whatever is in aspect to Pluto. Sooner or later, you're facing the end and it's change or die. So that's why, yes, the eighth house could be the end of the rope. And that's why you're experiencing your own mortality there. And quite often what happens to the eighth house that we're not dying, but we're seeing other people die. You know, we could lose a best friend. We could lose a job. We could lose something that make us realize, oh my God, I thought I was going to get a bonus this year and here I'm about to be fired. Oh my God, you know, my friend was just 30 years old and boom, you know, life takes them. So you, you suddenly experience those endings, those losses that reflect back on you and your own vulnerability. And then that gets you going. We all know that acknowledging death is very humbling. But acknowledging death also makes you understand it's not a free ride and the risks are real and you have to get your act together. So that eighth house transformation is where you go to the end of your rope and you feel so small and you feel like no one wants you anymore and you, you don't have the resources to keep going until the magic happens, until the butterfly, you know, the caterpillar is basically entering this, this phase and accepting to change. And they get a second lease. They get now wings, not just a new lease, because that's the Pluto medicine is that on the one hand, it takes you down, it depletes you, you feel like a loser. But through the transformation, you rise above the place you descend it from. So you realize there's much more to you than you thought. And so the Pluto transformation takes you beyond your original Mars. It gives you extra powers, extra intelligence, extra vitality. It boosts your immune system. And you become a superior human. And that's why, you know, Jupiter follows that. And you feel all happy in your Jupiterian phase because you're high after having transformed. And you feel again that the sky's the limit. I can go there. I can do all these things. I'm not dead yet. So the euphoria of Jupiter follows that intense... Pluto Mars uh, experience. And that is why Pluto is the higher octave of Mars. And that is why Pluto is 
the ruler of Scorpio because it, it adds that additional value to the original Mars. But why is Mars then co-ruling Scorpio? Because in a way, Pluto gives birth to a new Mars in the eighth house. So there's a, an upgraded Mars that comes out of that Pluto. You, you know, you get a new engine, you, you're more conscious, you're more intelligent, you, you're not just, you know, the, the kid you used to be. And you're then, you know, continuing your journey into the transpersonal world of Jupiter, then Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. These are the upper worlds where you needed that boost of consciousness through Scorpio, that gateway, because what you learn from Sagittarius to Pisces is higher knowledge. You, you're not just surviving anymore. You are looking at life from a holistic perspective. You're understanding the greater meaning that are unifying everybody. It's not just about surviving, reproducing, eating, and you know, breeding and, and, and dying, you realize the added value, the higher spiritual truth of our existence. So through that Plutonian, you know, Pluto basically was the gateway to give you, um, open the channels that will serve you, um, in, in those transpersonal realms. And what this means is that the work now is not only a work of physical endurance and you know building houses and, and growing food on your field. Now it's the work on yourself, the work on your consciousness. You are reaching these finer vibrations of Ev the soul's evolution. You're moving beyond the material realm to connect the spiritual with the material through 9, 10, 11, 12 houses, Sag to Pisces. Let's examine some of the key concepts here. Empowerment. So Mars and Pluto have everything to do with empowerment and potency. You know, we talked about how um, you get enough fuel when you're born and you feel powerful, you know, as the baby pushes out, it's a victory, they made it, we can cut the cord. And then you, you experience rejection, you experience defeat. So the Mars Pluto will take you through these experiences where your Mars energy is challenged. And so you can go through a risk of low self-esteem and impotence. I can't do anything. Whatever I do fails. You know, whatever I plant dies. All the projects I'm starting are failing. So that Mars Pluto can create that sense of impotence. You're exhausting your personal resource. You run out of money. You risk crashing. You risk your death. You are in dire need to regenerate somehow. So examine all these life situations where you're at the end of your rope. And unless something transform, you know, that dark night of the soul, when you go deep underground and you feel that it may be the end, but then you get the insight. Somebody comes in and helps you. You are allowing yourself to step outside of your pride of your attachments you're ready to relinquish 
the old you and you can regenerate. Also sexual transformation, you know, sexuality has to do with creativity. People who have Mars-Pluto interplays or when we go through Mars-Pluto by transit, we on the one hand can feel incredibly sexually potent. You know, Mars is sexual potency in both male and female. But when you have Mars Pluto, you can go through sexual crisis. And the crisis can simply be that your sex life is draining you. It's not real. You know, you're just mechanical about it. So it can be a loss of meaning. It could be a rejection that your partner feels like you're not enough. And they cheat on you or they want to open the marriage because they're not, you know, fully satisfied. And sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's not you. You know, sometimes there are many scenarios of why this happens, but usually this will happen to the Mars in Scorpio person, to the Mars Pluto person. That's why I correlate Mars in Scorpio with Mars Pluto aspect. And you'll see that in the examples I bring. So you can face sexual rejection. You know, you're, you're not attractive anymore. The, the, fire the passion died but then you know pluto mars people can go through periods of purging that means periods of celibacy periods where they abstain for sex and you think wait mars pluto mars in scorpio will not be sexual absolutely absolutely they they go through phases where they need to rethink sex, you know, they are in this place of limitation and sex becomes toxic. And unless they detach from it, purge it and regenerate, um, it's, it's not working. And there could of course be also physical issues, you know, diseases or, um, erectile dysfunction, accidents, you know, all kinds of things could happen where the person has to question their sexuality and from a Plutonian point of view, transform their sexuality. But deep down, the Mars-Pluto people are the shadow work people, which means that they are the change maker. They they cannot look the other way. They cannot avoid problems, their problems or the world problems. They are the activists. They are the change maker. They are the ones who are going to march to protest. They are going to be the agents of change on a societal level. The risk is that as they destroy, you know, what is obsolete and they, they're looking for that transformation, sometimes they can go to too far. And that's another part of, you know, a, a potential rage or, or the wrong motivation where there is a risk of irreparable damage so sometimes with mars pluto let's say you have mars pluto in your seventh house and you're going through this transformation in your relationships but in some cases you know it doesn't regenerate it's dead and maybe it's a good thing that you kill a relationship but if you keep killing all the relationships you have to ask yourself Am I regenerating or am I just burning the earth, you know, scorching the earth, scorching people? 
So that kind of dragon energy of, you know, radical destruction uh, is not always productive. So when you have Mars Pluto in action, you have intensity, change, regeneration, confrontation of shadow, anger, and rage. And it's the constant battle for life, meaning the battle to support life, to enhance life. <coughs> Sorry. Let's look at some examples and examine the cycle. So the last time we had a conjunction was March 2022. Now, what was really relevant during that time? Look at Venus. Venus was also right there. And you had this triple conjunction. Now, the, the critical thing is that Mars and Venus and Pluto were the rulers of the nodes of the time. So them coming together, of course, would have been some kind of major catalyst for a crisis, for a limitation, for something that makes us realize we cannot keep going that way. And that's when the Ukraine war started with Russia. Now, what, you know, what happened during this war, you know, you, you have Putin who feels cornered by NATO and the Ukraine wanting to join NATO. And of course, he has his own vision of the glorious empire of Russia that is no longer and so he is exerting his willpower and he meets, you know, this very resilient defense. Um, suddenly, you know, the Ukraine finds resources, you know, they're, they're at the risk of extinction. They're at the risk of being devoured by some entity you know a big monster and they're taken down you know they are now in their underworld journey and something needs to change for them to regenerate <clears throat> the same thing with putin you know from his mars pluto point of view he thought this is going to be accessible it's it's mine to take and he realizes that he is risking everything. He's risk losing everything. You know, his credibility is down the drain. He is, you know, wasting people's lives. It's a, it, you know, it's a very humbling experience for Putin where he recognizes his mortality. He recognizes he may not make it. So he's, he's in that underworld as well. And both need to face the shadows and both need, in order to regenerate, they need to talk to Pluto, harness their power and regenerate somehow. And of course, on a global level, a uh, spike of price, you know, food prices going up, you know, the economy is terribly unstable and the resources are, are not as accessible. Um, and then now we are at a point of opposition. So that's the first time since that conjunction that Pluto Mars are now at their climax. And it can be a turning point as far as that shadow work. And I've spoken about this in previous videos that this opposition is right on Zelensky's Mars at zero Leo. So he's having a Mars return as it opposes Pluto. So will he get that second lease? Will he get, you know, that ability to 
conquer, you know, to get out of the shadow, to re resurrect, to reemerge from the deep. Um, and from for all of us, you know, we have to see where we're at with our lives, what house this is in, where can where are we possibly feeling those limitations, this sense of depletion, this sense of impotence, this feeling that uh, things cannot continue the way they are, that it's a do or die, change or die situation. So in some ways, if we speak globally and we speak personally, maybe the two entities will realize in all humility you know, that they need to start negotiating. You know, they need to do the Aquarius work, Pluto in Aquarius, you know, fight with words, not with missiles. Who knows? We can hope. Then next year, 2024, Pluto Mars meet again and venus is also back to that 27 degree where the previous conjunction was but this time the pluto mars is at zero aquarius just as pluto enters aquarius mars joins and so it's the exact opposite degree that we're having now so you get it if you have planets at zero fixed you're in it for a ride. And going back to Zelensky, his Mars is zero Leo, which means he's going to have the opposition and he's going to have the conjunction opposing his Mars next year. And his sun is five degrees Aquarius. So all of us with planets at zero fixed are in a Mars-Pluto cycle of where our potency, our willpower, our capacity to overcome challenges, our sense of self, our, our will, how to put it, our ability to win the day is going to be in question. And if we don't really do deep soul work, we may lose a lot. But if we do the soul work, we can rise to a much higher level. You know, it can be that upgrade of, you know, the phoenix rising from the flame and becoming this magnificent uh, super bird. Interesting examples, you know, one of our uh, astrological heroes, Dane Rudyard, was born with Mars-Pluto conjunct in Gemini, the sixth house. And he, you know, was an Aries to begin with, so Mars was very important. And he also had, you know, uh, Saturn and Uranus in, in Scorpio. So this Mars Pluto is in the sixth house. And one of the things he experienced is a near death experience because of a health issue. He had dysfunctional kidneys. So he had to go, you know, he had to have an operation surgery when he was a teenager. And so his vitality was affected by this condition think about mars pluto vitality and kidneys are typically libra but adrenals that sit on the kidneys are aries and mars so our vitality is immediately linked to the kidneys and the adrenals and so he had to constantly now manage his energies, how much to sleep, how much, what to eat, you know, be on, on this super diligent regimen uh, to monitor his energy levels. So think how Mars Pluto that is, that 
his risk of death and his risk of depletion is constant. And yet he lived a long life and he became this super prolific writer, Gemini, producing extraordinary work. But the interesting thing is that not only, you know, what motivated him to write is that he was one of the agents of change in the world of astrology. He, first of all, left his natal land of France, emigrated to the United States. So that's a transformation also. But then he, um, you know, his, his motivation, his, his kind of, Trans transformational power was that he brought humanistic astrology on the table, breaking away from a deterministic, fatalistic type of astrology that was used mostly until, you know, until the 18th century. So through the Theosophical Society and his own research, he developed this humanistic approach that has everything to do with Mars Pluto, which basically has to do with the transformation of consciousness. You know, he was the pioneer behind evolutionary astrology. You know, his the the concepts of evolutionary astrology emerged from his body of knowledge. So speaking about how consciousness can change your fate. You know, if you do the work of transformation, Mars Pluto, you can use your chart to a higher level. You can overcome the debilities, the, the difficult aspects of your chart and, and rise to a higher level of expression. So that's a really interesting concept of course neptune is there on the angles another interesting example you know angelina jolie is born with a mars pluto opposition in the nine third house and she went through her journey of potency and impotence you know, she used to be very dark and very intense as, as a young actress and young lady. And she lost, you know, many of the female figures of her family to cancer, which was, you know, the moon is right next to that Mars Pluto. But, you know, she went through her dark night of the soul. She went through you know, marriages where I, uh, what, what was his name? Billy, Billy Bob Thorne, something like that. One of the actors. And they used to, you know, suck blood in front of the cameras uh, as, as a stunt. And, and so she was kind of this very, uh, confrontational and and playing with darkness very plutonian um, character and then you know she went through her own transformation and became suddenly this agent of change she became the ambassador of goodwill and she traveled the world for good causes she became the activist and as an activist, she's, you know, she wanted to adopt children and she adopted her first child, Maddox, um, who himself is a Mars Pluto dude. So his Mars Pluto opposes Saturn right on her natal son, Neptune. Son is children, Neptune adoption. His Mars Pluto transformation lands right on that. And see the correlation between houses and signs. Her Mars is in the ninth house, his Mars is in Sag. So that polarity of Gemini, 
Sag is recaptured by her ninth house, third house. And it obviously has to do with adopting kids from different cultures. But, you know, Maddox is born with this Mars, Pluto, Saturn. You can see he went through his own abandonment. You know, um, and as a Mars Pluto in Sagittarius, you think he's going to be outspoken? Just as much as his mom, if not more. It's opposing Saturn. So he's going to confront authority. He's going to expose corruption. You know, he is an angry dude because he sees the shadows. He sees the deceptions, the, you know, Sagittarius, where is the shadow? The, you know, the, the misguided truth. Now, where's Brad Pitt's son? Wait, Brad Pitt is a mid Sagittarius son. So that Mars Pluto is right on Brad Pitt's son. And they, they went through their own intense relationship. And I'm sure she she's also, you know, learning to handle him. You know, Mars Pluto kids. They're going to, um, how to put it, they're going to confront their parents. You know, they're not going to take bullshit. They are going to be intense kids who want the truth, who do not want sugarcoating, who want to be super honest. And who are going to get angry if, if they can't trust you. Another interesting example, Gandhi. Gandhi is born with Mars in Scorpio, opposing Pluto. You think he was a change maker? You think he had to go through his dark night of the soul? You think he had to transform as this fancy lawyer, you know, taking the train in first class and being himself a snob, being himself racist, you know, speaking about black people as inferior when he is himself cornered and put on the spot and asked, you know, to move from first class to the um, regular uh, carrier he suddenly feels rejected he suddenly feels impotent he suddenly feels that he cannot defend himself against this injustice and he is reduced to being a person of color get out of here you don't belong with the elite you don't have a right you know to be uh, with the white people and that takes him to a, you know, a cold shower, a terrible sense of defeat. But what ends up cooking inside is a revolution. And this prompts a whole movement of not only his personal transformation, but the transformation of India. But most interestingly, from a very Mars Pluto way in the first house is that instead of destroying and using a scorched earth policy, instead of using violence to retaliate and to justify, you know, his revolution, he could have, you know, we would have understood if like the French revolution or you know, whatever revolution, it would get bloody. But in a very scorpionic way, in his own transformation of consciousness and elevation of consciousness, he realized the best way to fight and to reach your goal is through non-violent protest. 
how powerful that is with the Mars Pluto. The, here you really see the essence of transformation. But interestingly, you know, if you know a little bit about his personal story, you see Venus, Mars, seventh house. He had a lot of issues with his sexuality. He had a lot of issues with women. And he was a misogynist for the most part until, you know, he went through his own transformation. And he went through phases where he renounced sexuality mars venus in scorpio asexual because he was purging centuries incarnations of having sexual desires control him so he needed to elevate his sexuality to bring more consciousness to his sexuality, to transform it so that it wouldn't become itself a beast that devours him. The greed of sexual appetite, you know, was overpowering. So he needed the fast. Um, another interesting example, Ronan Farrow and Woody Allen both Mars, Pluto. So Woody Allen is born with a Mars, Pluto opposition in his fifth house. Mars is in his fifth house. And, you know, one of the things that we're aware of is that there are allegations of sexual abuse of his adoptive daughter, and he married another adoptive daughter and questions about whether, she, you know, this affair began when she was under age, you know. So very much this Mars Pluto. And he was, you know, if we look at his personal life, this Mars Pluto definitely affected him as a kid because he was not the, you know, the football team captain. He was this frail, anxious boy, probably bullied, probably rejected, you know, not the pretty boy who who gets, you know, all the, the girl's attention. And, you know, in his own Mars Pluto way, he makes fun of his vulnerability of his neurotic behavior and he created this masterpiece of cinema and and script writing and he becomes this amazingly uh admired director and and and, and writer but then you know comes the controversy with uh Mia Farrow's children and his own child, uh, Ronan, Ronan Farrow, who is born with a Mars Pluto in Scorpio. And he is basically uh, exposed in a very unflattering way, you know, whether even if everything was legal, um, marrying your stepdaughter is, is weird. And, and having sexual relationships with a, you know, a, 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 a young teenage, you know, woman who just emerged from her teenage years is questionable. And that's very Mars in Capricorn. You know, Mars in Capricorn can be attracted to older people or younger. And I mean generation youngers or generations older. So the controversy, you know, if we just go by what's on the surface is obviously already there. And so he's going through his own sense of shame and, and being uh, vilified and being rejected um, in the movie industry. You know, he lost his credibility. And it's interesting that all his movies since 
that time, it already started before, but particularly since that time is always the script revolves around good guy, bad guy. And the good guy who's always honest, who's very well-meaning, ends up with a miserable life. And the bad guy who manipulates the system, who knows how to lie, who knows how to manipulate his way around or her way around, is ending up with a good life. So he is, in his movie, he keeps vindicating malice. And, you know, it's a message of don't be a sucker. Good people are suckers. And, you know, it captures his own, uh, his own journey, I believe. So his son, quote unquote, biological son, who apparently is the son of Frank Sinatra instead, Ronan Farrow, is a journalist, and you see his chart with Sun, Uranus, Mercury, Saturn, it's Sag, so very educated, scholarly, uh, intelligent, and articulate. And he's a journalist, and guess what? With Mars Pluto in Scorpio, he's going to be an undercover journalist and he's going to re, you know really bring interesting pieces confronting corruption so Ronan Farrow was instrumental with catalyzing the me too movement and the abuse of power of you know the patriarchal dominant males in showbiz industry um but everywhere really and of course his own father biological or not um is is on the spot because of his own me too allegations and so you see this battle raging between them he's trying to take his father down and you know he's a mar he's a son Saturn father opposing Chiron wound of the father, but that Mars Pluto never he's not giving up, you know he's gonna go after him, however way he can, as long as he is convinced that there's something to hide that there's, you know that he's guilty. So you see, you know, Woody Allen is also fighting. He's also not giving up. And and how, you know, you see these two charts with Angelina and her son, and then with Woody Allen and Ronan Farrow, you see how these aspects repeat generationally. Another interesting example is uh, Princess Diana, who is born with a Mars Pluto on her North Node. And when any planet is on your node, you're going to feel it, you know, because these planets are amplified. They dominate the chart. So you have a Mars Pluto as well as Uranus on the regulus fixed star and what is she feeling she's feeling this on the one hand you know marrying a prince and living the fairy tale but that prince is rejecting her as pretty as she is as loved as she is by everyone he chooses another and so she's facing this Pluto in Virgo, you know, body conscious, anorexia, anxiety, going through her own end of rope, her own feeling of powerlessness, her own feeling of being worthless, which was probably triggered by also childhood stuff. 
Um, but interestingly, as as she transformed, you know, she's the she's going to divorce Charles, even though she doesn't win him over, and he ends up with Camilla, and Camilla is the queen today. Uh, Diana realizes that she needs to separate. She needs to save her own soul. And she needs to reinvent herself. And she becomes this ambassador of, you know, good causes and, and against mining. And her charisma and popularity only, you know, increases. But at the same time, you know, she's controversial. Um, there are many conspiracies that we know around her story. But eventually, you know, she dies in this car crash in a tunnel, Pluto, as the sun and Ceres, Persephone and Ceres are right on Pluto. So that whole being taken to the underworld is, couldn't be more graphic. And there's an echo of that Mars Pluto in Mars by transit being in Scorpio on her Neptune, you know, trining her sun, etc. So you see that as much as she reinvented herself and regenerated, she eventually died. You know, the risk of death especially when Mars and Pluto are on the nodes, you know, people experience these intense life and can experience these intense life and death situations. And at the same time, you know, my, my whole work on the death chart also shows where the soul is at and what they're trying to accomplish where, you know, the death chart is a new birth chart. That's a topic for another time. But needless to say that the transits are really powerful, informative. So, you know, we examine this Pluto-Mars interplay and how Mars begins this journey and needs to meet Pluto in order to get to the next level. That's the octave relationship. Now, some people are born, you know, with these types because you have the Mercury-Uranus octave which we're going to explore in the next video, and then Venus-Neptune octave. And I'm going to give you this example where you see a couple here. You see, let's start with Hillary. She's a Mars-Pluto born, tight, 14 Leo. And it's, if the time of birth is correct, that's a new time that we have to 18 a.m., up. Uh, no, that's not 2.80 a.m. It's 6.45 p.m. Don't look at that. Um, it's angular. It's right on her IC. But more than that, it squares her sun and a whole uh, grouping, a whole stellium in Scorpio. So that's you know, when you see in someone's chart a repetition of Mars, Pluto, Aries, Scorpio, first house, eighth house, over and over, on angles, on the nodes, inside. You, you start to see that this person is really embodying these energies as, as their own existence. So Hillary is a Mars-Pluto type. 
she's not just born with a conjunction, her whole chart captures the intensity between these two archetypes. And so by definition, you can say she is the type of person who is going to face, you know, she's going to be extremely resourceful, very powerful, but she's going to come to a place where she faces rejection, where she sees corruption, where she has to question her own self. And she has to go through a state, you know, she has to go through her own underworld and confront her own demons to resurrect more to you know, on a higher level. And you see her journey, you know, on the one hand, she's this powerful woman who, you know, became the secretary of state high up in the political echelon, you know, paving the way for other women Leo women, you know, Mars and Leo women are going to be role models in that sense. But her husband rejects her sexually and flirts around. Number one, first rejection. And the second rejection is that at the moment of her prime, when she's about to reach to the maximum and become the first woman president of the United States, she's rejected, she's defeated. And that's a, you know, that's a Mars Pluto experience of don't take your power for granted. Don't take your victories for granted. It can slip you know, in the least expected times. And so these people, you know, with this Mars Pluto, who face these violations of trust, face these, um, you know, the, these experiences where they see their power diminishing, where they lose battles, they have to go deep into their, own plutonian realm and do therapy and and do spiritual work to be able to access to transform from the underworld to the upper world so we'll see if she reinvents herself um in any meaningful way right now she's kind of keeping low profile. Um, but part of her victory, you know, is to see how Donald Trump is kind of entangled in so many scandals that she can sit and, you know, have a glass of wine and laugh at the situation. But still, on a personal level, you see how she didn't reclaim her power. We don't know yet, you know, if if that defeat is going to transform in a meaningful way. If if it's the end of her political and personal career, could be given her age as well. Now you look at Bill Clinton, and what do you see? One, two, three, four, five, six planet asteroids in Libra with Libra rising. And Venus in Libra, and a moon in Taurus. And so you see this repetition of Venus energy, Venus, Libra, Taurus, Venus, Neptune conjunction. So she's a Mars-Pluto conjunction. He's a Venus-Libra conjunction, and he's tons of planets in the Venus signs. She's tons of planets in the Mars-Pluto signs. So you see that he's a Venus-Neptune type of person. And what are Venus-Neptune types of people? They don't want confrontations. They want to see the positive in everything. They are optimists. They are charismatic. They're mellow. Whereas the Mars-Pluto type are confrontational. They're intense. They're change makers. 
um, they are constantly on the edge of, you know, the adrenaline pulse. And the Venus Neptune people want peace. They don't want drama. So you can expect him to be this agreeable husband, you know, who's going to try to support her. But on the other hand, can he handle her intensity? That's the thing that we often attract opposite types. Because if you had two Mars people, Mars Pluto people in the same marriage, it's becoming a very intense. So they're balancing each other in those energies. But it's a tough marriage because they are so different on a, such a fundamental level. And yet that's the magic of astrology. And that's how we as counselor, you know, can talk to them and explain what this is about. So, you know, stay tuned for the next chapters. I invite you to my website again, where you can choose um, workshops. You can buy single workshops. You don't have to always get the full the um, diploma course. So go to astrology studies and choose by topic. And you're going to have Mars and, and uh, other planets um, workshops. I also invite you to look at my books. Um, I think you'll, if you don't have them, You'll gain a lot from them and you support astrology. Uh, available for private consultations always. That's also on the website. So thank you, everyone. And until next time, stay safe and make the best out of these transits.